The title of the presentation is Israel, Iran, and China's Belt and Road Initiative. It's important that you understand the global context for understanding current events. When you're looking at God's word and you're reading it and you are trying to understand end time events, biblical prophecy, you have to understand that the events described in the Bible as it relates to what's coming upon the earth do not happen in isolation. They, they are part of a global context. They are part of a context of events which move and shape our planet. So you must understand that when you're talking about biblical prophecy and what's coming in the future, you cannot just open the Bible and just point to a passage and really fully understand what's, what's in view because it's in a context and it's important that God's people understand the framework and the context of the days in which we're living. Global context is important. Now, I want to explain something very briefly to you or highlight it. And for those of you who are regular attenders, you may have heard me say this before. The concept of imminence, that Jesus Christ can come at any moment without any prophesied events taking place prior, is not biblical. You may have been taught it for much of your life. That Jesus Christ can come in an instant, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And that's true. But the fact that he is coming unannounced without anything going on on the earth, without any events taking place, without any context, is not true. The Bible does not teach imminence that Jesus Christ can return at any moment before any prophesied events must occur. What the Bible does teach is expectancy, that the events spoken of in the Bible in connection to the Lord's second coming those events could take place in my and your lifetime. And therefore, Jesus Christ could return in our lifetime if the events spoken of in Scripture before those days occur during our lifetime. That's different than imminence, that nothing has to transpire before Jesus Christ returns. There is a context of current events and things that we should be watching for before the Lord's second coming. I want to point out to you two major issues taking place, major factors going on or transpiring in our world today that are shaping the planet in ways that we almost could have never before imagined. I want to highlight two of them for you today because, again, this is the context out of which prophesied events will transpire. The first is the fourth industrial revolution the fourth industrial revolution. Now I'm gonna talk some political things here with you. I'm gonna read some things. I don't want you to, I don't wanna lose you here because these things are so important to give you a sense of what is happening in our world. And I wanna help you understand what I think is at play here and I think it's very significant for understanding. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes reading some of these things I typically don't like to read but I, I really want you to see what's happening here in our world. This is an, an article entitled The Fourth Industrial Revolution. It was penned by a European individual. His name was Klaus Schwab. If you've ever heard of Davos, Switzerland, Davos is a, a small town, wealthy town in Switzerland where the biggest government officials in the world, the, the elite of the elite, the billionaires of the world, the Bill Gates of the world, and so many others will convene at a place called Davos, Switzerland. And in that location, there is a, an organization called the World Economic Forum. And the World Economic Forum postulates ideas for planet Earth and the trends and movements of what is taking place in planet Earth, on planet Earth. What is coming down the pike? So he is the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. He created it. And these are his words. We stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, scope, and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. We do not yet know just how it will unfold, but one thing is clear. The response to it must be integrated and comprehensive, involving all stakeholders of the global polity, from the public, private sectors, to academia and civil society. The first industrial revolution used water and steam power to mechanize production. 
The second used electric power to create mass production. The third industrial revolution used electronics and information technology to automate production. Now a fourth industrial revolution is building on the third. The digital revolution that has been occurring since the middle of the last century. It is characterized by a fusion or a coming together of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. Did you get that? The possibility of billions of people connected by mobile devices, of which you probably all hold in your hand or in your purses or in your pockets, with unprecedented processing power, storage capacity, and access to knowledge are unlimited. And these possibilities will be multiplied by emerging technological breakthroughs in fields such as artificial intelligence, AI, which you're going to be hearing more and more about in coming days, robotics, the Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles that drive by themselves, 3D printing, nanotechnology, biotechnology, material science, energy storage, and quantum computing. Now, a lot of that sounds over our heads, mine as well. Just know that all of these things are going to be utilized to integrate in ways that we never before imagined that will reshape the way the planet operates. How about its impact on business, what's coming, this fourth industrial revolution? A key trend is the development of technology-enabled platforms that combine both demand and supply to disrupt existing industry structures. So the way things have been going all along, they're all going to be interrupted and changed such as those we see within sharing or on-demand economy, where we have instant gratification. We order it, it's delivered to our front door in record time. These technology platforms rendered easy to use by the smartphone convene people, assets, and data, thus creating entirely new ways of consuming goods and services. Sound familiar? In addition, they lower the barriers for business and individuals to create wealth altering the personal and professional environments of workers. People staying home, working from home on computers. These new platform businesses are rapidly multiplying into many new services ranging from laundry to shopping, from chores to parking, from massages to travel. How about the impact on government that the fourth industrial revolution will have? As the physical digital and biological worlds continue to converge. New technologies and platforms will increasingly enable citizens to engage with governments, voice their opinions, coordinate their efforts, and even circumvent the supervision of public authorities. I have my questions about the ability of ordinary citizens to be able to, to communicate effectively where governments will respond in those ways, but nonetheless, this is what he said. But listen to what he says. Simultaneously to that, governments will gain new technological powers to increase their control over populations based on pervasive surveillance systems and the ability to control digital infrastructure. Did you get that? It's very important for our discussion. The ability of governments to control digital infrastructure and data about each of us. The fourth industrial revolution will also profoundly impact the nature of national and international security. We're all worried about security with everything that we've been seeing going on in our country. The history of warfare and international security is the history of technological innovation. And today is no exception. Modern conflicts involving states or nation states are increasingly hybrid in nature, meaning they're, they're merging together. Combining traditional battlefield techniques, i.e. using bombs and bullets to fight wars, with elements previously associated with non-state actors. The distinction between war and peace combatant and non-combatant, and even violence and non-violence, for instance, think cyber warfare, a war that's taking place, which we're hearing about all the time now, taking place on the internet or digitally between nations. These are making life to become uncomfortably blurry, blurring the lines so that people don't understand where things are clearly moving. How about the impact on people? The fourth industrial revolution finally will change not only what we do, but also who we are. 
It will affect our identity. Did you get that? There's been a lot of talk about biochips connected to vaccines and how they're going to control. Everyone's going to get a global identity. There's lots of the connected to people's concern about the, the mark of the beast. All of those things have been discussed at length. It will affect our identity and all the issues associated with it. Our sense of privacy, our notions of ownership, our consumption patterns, how we purchase things and buy things, the time we devote to work and leisure, and how we develop our careers, cultivate our skills, meet people. If you're walking around with a mask or you're socially distancing, it is changing the dynamic of our planet, of how people relate to one another. It is already changing our health and leading to a quantified self. And sooner than we think, it may lead to human augmentation, which means using digital means or computer means to allow humans to do superhuman things. The list is endless because, listen to what he says, it is bound only by our imagination. Translation, there is no God. Humanism. Humanism. In the end, it all comes down to people and values, he says. We need to shape, we need to shape a future that works for all of us, i.e. socialism or technocratic socialism where unelected bureaucratic technocrats who are experts in specific fields will make decisions that they think are the are best for all the rest of us. A future that works for all of us by putting people first and empowering them. In its most pessimistic, dehumanized form, the fourth industrial revolution may indeed have the potential to robotize, make us robots, and thus to deprive us of our heart and soul. But as a complement to the best parts of human nature, creativity, empathy, and stewardship, it can also lift humanity into a new collective, read socialism, and moral consciousness based on a shared sense of destiny. This is Global Socialism 101. But I want to just tell you, and, I'm, and that's where I'll end with this. Again, this was written by Klaus Schwab, founder of the World Economic Forum, and he wrote this almost five years ago. Almost five years ago. But what took place with the coronavirus pandemic is rocketing us into the things that are being discussed here in this fourth industrial revolution. That is the first global issue that you must understand as it relates to what is happening on our planet and where things are moving as we approach the end of the age. The second is the rise of China. The rise of China. China is no longer a sleeping giant. You have been hearing probably more about China in this year than maybe you have collectively in all of your years. China is in the news more and more and more. And I will tell you that based on my study, research, and my understanding, is you're going to continue to hear about China in the days ahead. Because the threat is not by and large Russia. Russia may do some things that are unsavory and they're involved and they are a power. But Russia is not the focus. China is the focus. Now let me put it in, in context for you and why this is so important because we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about China this morning. In 2001, China was admitted to what's known as the World Trade Organization, the WTO. The World Trade Organization is essentially a group of nations worldwide, global in nature, that have agreed to trade policies and there is a judicial aspect of the World Trade Organization that makes decisions for the rest of the world as it relates to trade. So if there are discrepancies uh, and there are nations that are unhappy with other nations, there is a World Trade Organization judicial branch, a set of judges, that will make rulings to determine, and they're supposed to be neutral, to make determinations as to which nation was in the right and which nation was in the wrong as it relates to trade. Over the last several years, 
because of China's unfair trade practices, our government has been trying to undermine intentionally the judicial branch of the, of the World Trade Organization to essentially undermine its power and authority to make decisions related to trade and commerce on planet Earth. And to, at this point, essentially, that judicial aspect of the World Trade Organization no longer functions, and we are entering a whole new world of trade between nations. This is a huge, huge issue. So much of what you're seeing in the news is related to this issue at its core. Now, China was admitted to this World Trade Organization back in 2001, 19 years ago. Since China was admitted, and here, let me tell you the reason why they were admitted first. They were admitted to this organization because the United States and our European allies thought, this is gonna be fantastic. Our big corporations can expand because China has a huge population that is just waiting to, to, to partake and to purchase a lot of the things that we produce as Europeans and Americans. And at the same time, we're gonna not only improve our market share, but we're going to uh, be able to change the communist regime of China. When, once we pull them into our Western sphere of business and trade, we're gonna, we're gonna encourage the Chinese Communist Party to change its colors and to, to acquiesce to become more like America and more like the West. The exact opposite took place in the last 19 years. Listen to this carefully. China's economy grew eight times over in 19 years. In other words, China's economy today is eight times larger than it was only 19 years ago. Do you have any idea the staggering impact of the communist China nation in our world today? It is absolutely staggering the growth that has taken place. And this is the reason that the West is so concerned about what is going on with communist China today. Now, there are, th there are three strategies that China has embarked upon in recent years. And it's important that you get these, really important, because these three will give you the framework for understanding what they're trying to do, okay? The first one, is called China's Belt and Road Initiative. Now, this is where we're gonna spend more time in just a few more minutes. Uh, but this is the first one, the China's Belt and Road Initiative. Just to give you a brief explanation of what that is, and I, I don't wanna lose you here, this is important that you get it. The Belt and Road Initiative is through massive global investments and construction, China is developing new land and sea economic corridors to link with Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. So China, huge nation that it is geographically, is creating new links, new corridors, economic corridors by land and by sea to link to Africa, the Middle East, and to Europe. As the largest infrastructure project in human history, the Belt and Road Initiative is central to the communist regime's ambition to make China the world's preeminent power. Now, do I need to remind you, this is a communist regime. They're playing the free market for its own benefit, but they are authoritarian communists, and they have a goal, a strategic goal, to be the world's preeminent power. And their economy has just grown eight times its size over only 19 years. Number two, China's digital Silk Road. By the way, the Belt and Road Initiative was announced in 2013. In 2013, it was announced by China. Now in 2015, only two years later, they announced China's Digital Silk Road. What is the Digital Silk Road? Do you remember, before we read that, do you remember Marco Polo? Have you ever heard about him in history? Okay. You, you, a lot of you, if you're in swimming pools, your kids or grandkids may have played Marco Polo in the swimming pool. But the historical figure Marco Polo during his time, during that time frame, there was massive trade taking place between the East in China and the West, Rome and Byzantium, which today is modern day Istanbul and Turkey. There was a trade route over land back and forth, and from the East went silk from the Orient towards Europe, and in exchange, gold 
precious metals came back on that same Silk Road back to the Orient, back to China and to Asia. It's called the Silk Road. China is resurrecting it, but in a brand new and modern way called the Digital Silk Road. In tandem with its Belt and Road Initiative, which we just mentioned, which was the first strategy of China, the second one is intended to enhance digital connectivity between China and her neighbors, extend China's influence abroad, and further its ascendancy as a technological superpower. China's ultimate goal, however, with the Digital Silk Road, is to implement a new global payment system that would replace the dollar with a Chinese digital currency. Now, let me take you back for a moment. Remember, when China entered the World Trade Organization 19 years ago, since that point, their economy has grown eight times over. Now, China wants to create economic corridors using their old digital, or using their Silk Road concept by land and by sea, and we'll explore that in a few more minutes. And also digitally, they want to do this with all of the nations that have signed on with them to their Belt and Road Initiative. So in other words, when China goes into a country, as an example, like um, Djibouti, funny name, but it's a country in Africa, a very strategic choke point going into the Red Sea. China will go to Djibouti, which is a relatively poorer country, but they're very strategically located. And, and China says, you know, we'd like to help with your infrastructure, so we'll give you a low interest loan, and we will build for you a huge port here in your country of Djibouti at the entrance to the Red Sea. It's gonna be great. It's gonna help you with economics and commerce. It's gonna raise your standard of living in your country. It's gonna be fabulous. And China knows in many instances that some of these nations will never be able to pay back the loan. And therefore, it's called a debt trap. And therefore, China then takes over the port. Already the Ch Chinese that were running the port when they build it, but they will eventually take it over and they can use it not only for commerce and econ economics, but for military purposes in strategic locations. Ladies and gentlemen, China is doing this exact thing that I just described all over the world in cities that you would not believe. And we're gonna point it out to you in just a few more minutes. However, more than 130 nations did you get that? More than 130 nations have signed on with China for, to be a participant in their Belt and Road Initiative, 130. Now, if China has 130 nations and all of these hundreds of billions of dollars worth of infrastructure projects that they're creating, roads, bridges, railroads, ports, all over the world, for the purpose of being able to connect all of the manufacturing that China does to export it to all parts of the world, it would make sense that China would want a digital component of that, internet and other things, and their own currency to be able to trade in. Since China is the originator of all these things, they would want their own currency to be able to trade. And you know what happens to the dollar if that happens? This is a world war, ladies and gentlemen, that is taking place right now for who is going to control planet Earth. This is no longer just America having its way around the world, in many respects benevolently around the world. This is a very different thing that is taking place now. You have two polar opposite world views of how things should go. When China is looking to invest in other countries and say, hey, w uh, Djibouti, we'd like to, to build this, um, this port for you. Does China go in and say, you know, but you have to, these human rights violations are not so good. You, you've really got to improve on your human rights uh, issues and you've got to, you know, you're not treating people very good. Your labor practices aren't so hot. You need to improve that before we, before we invest in you. No. China has a no question asked policy related to those things. So rogue nations, for instance, like Iran, which we'll talk about in a few moments, are more than happy to take China's money and investment and Iran, and China isn't asking anything of Iran as it relates to human rights issues or other things. When America and the West go to these nations or the Europeans go to these nations, we say, we'll invest, but you've got to clean up your, your human rights violations. You've got to improve your labor situations. China doesn't do that. That's why they're able to just go into these nations, throw money at them, and the nations are very happy to acquiesce to China's demands. 
So financial system. And lastly, the third component, made in China 2025. This is a policy that also was enacted in 2015 by China. Made in China 2025. What does that mean? First announced in 2015, Made in China 2025, is a plan that calls for Chinese companies to control 10 key sectors of the global market around the world. Among these are big ones, pharmaceuticals. Ah, did we hear about pharmaceuticals this year? That China manufactures all the pharmaceuticals and are we gonna be even, even able to be getting Tylenol here, right? Big discussion about pharmaceuticals. Automotive issues related to uh, cars with robotics and things of that nature. Aerospace, artificial intelligence, there it is again. Robotics and clean energy. China wants to dominate in these realms, but of great concern to the United States and other international markets is the Chinese government's subsidizing. It's cheating. The government itself, the communist government of China is saying to companies that they have it within China, you develop this, we'll just feed you the money from the government and you develop your product and then you can not only unroll, uh, roll it out here in the domestic economy of China, but you can roll it out globally. What other nation, if they're not being, what other company, if they're not being subsidized by a government can compete with that? China's giving money under the table to its, to its companies. And then the companies are going out and selling cheaper than any other competing nation for the same thing. You may have heard of a company by the name of Huawei. It's not on the front page. It's been on page two, five, seven, ten of the newspapers. But all through the pandemic, you've been hearing about, if you're watching, about Huawei, a massive Chinese 5G telecommunications company that has been looking to install telecommunications 5G technology, which is going to transform the entire planet. Remember, fourth industrial revolution. And America has said to all the nations looking to install this 5G Chinese technology, if you do it, nations, allies, we will no longer share United States intelligence with you because we cannot trust that the Chinese Communist Party is not going to be listening in. So America has been pushing these nations to cancel the contracts around the world with nations that have signed on with China for their Belt and Road Initiative to cancel 5G telecommunications contracts. It's happening all over the planet. That's one example. Now that you know the three strategies of China, let's take a look at the map briefly, and I must go quickly. So here, obviously, you can see the massive geographical region that China controls. I've highlighted some, some nations larger than others because they're significant in our discussion for today, um, but we'll quickly move on. This is a very simplified map of China's land corridor that they're creating. You can see it goes from Beijing, Xi'an, China, all the way through. Now, these are very important. Into these er this region, this is called the Central Asian Islamic Republics. Central Asian Islamic Republics. The stands, if you will. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran. Azerbaijan, okay? So these Central Asian Islamic republics are going to be huge beneficiaries of China's Belt and Road Initiative, and they've all signed on to it. So this bridge, this, old, this new Silk Road, if you will, is moving through. Iran, I want to highlight Iran. In the news, in the last month and a half, Iran leaked a document that said, we have just signed or are about to sign a $400 billion deal with China for China to invest in our banking sector, infrastructure, ports, etc. Where are the ports of Iran? The ports of Iran are in the Persian Gulf. Remember, we have sanctions on Iran right now. So in direct disregard, that's putting it nicely. For American sanctions and European sanctions against Iran, China says, mm -mm. we're going to invest $400 billion over a period of years in Iran because we want a hand in what's going on in the Middle East. Very significant prophetically. We want a hand here. So China is investing big dollars in Iran because Iran is a major link 
on that Silk Road. From there, it's going through the area of Turkey. Turkey is becoming a more, more of a rogue nation every day. They are arch enemy now of Israel. They have talked about wanting to come down, take over Jerusalem. Uh, once again, remember the Ottoman Turkish Empire ruled most, most of the Middle East for 400 years, controlled Jerusalem. So Tehran and then Istanbul. You see the link? You see the link between Tehran and Istanbul, Iran and Turkey? Very significant when you read your Bible. Ezekiel chapter 38 and some of the other passages talks about an invasion from the north into Israel in the last days, and it specifically lists tribal areas of today's Turkey and Iran that will join together and come down in the last days. You see how the context of current events today are moving us ever closer to the events of the last days when you see the economic corridor that's taking place here. And this is designed, and remember, this is not just one road. There are a series of roads that come off of this. It's roads, it's trains, it's natural gas pipelines, oil pipelines that crisscross this whole region. I'm just showing you the simplified version of the road. But there, it goes into all of these other countries as it moves along. From there, its destination is Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and it will make other stops throughout Europe. Why is China doing this once again? Because it wants to m manufacture, control, and export all of its goods throughout much of this region. And if it does that, and it links these nations in, it will change the currency structure financially to control those areas. But it's not just over land. By sea, you can see all of these major ports, Vietnam, India, Singapore. Interesting one here, Gwadar in Pakistan. Where is that located strategically? Near the entrance to the Persian Gulf. Remember energy supplies, Persian Gulf. And they're going to also extend it into this region with Iran. Remember we just talked about the new deals, the new deal that it's been signed, 400 billion between China and Iran. So they'll have other ports that they're controlling. They're improving the infrastructure and they will run the ports in, into this area as well. Then I mentioned to you Djibouti at the entrance to the Red Sea. Again, another strategic choke point into the Red Sea for shipping. We won't talk about Neom today, but that's the new artificial intelligence all natural energy city that is being developed by the Saudis also being invested in heavily by China. And you're going to be watching, watch for, watch for what happens in Neom over the coming years as that develops. It's going to be a prototype incubator lab laboratory city for all of the technologies of the world are going to be implemented in Neom if it comes to fruition. Already the Saudis have built massive palaces. If you can look at it on Google Earth, you'll be amazed. Massive Saudi Arabian palaces have been already built in Neom in the middle of the desert. Much more is to come on that. But that will be another stop through the Suez Canal. Do you know that China already controls a large portion of the port of Athens, Greece? The port of Piraeus? We sailed in and out of there many times. The China run, Chinese run the port. Also, did you know that Italy was also a signator for China's Belt and Road Initiative, giving up control of significant areas of their ports in Venice and Genoa on the other side of Italy? They've already given them up because China was dangling money. Italy was in a, in a very difficult financial position in the European Union. They needed the money. They signed on. And all the way through to Rotterdam and other places in between as well. But it's more. Because you see, when you look at this, you say, okay, well, I don't see too much going on here in Israel, right? Wrong. Let's zoom in on what's happening in Israel. Because China also wants an alternative route. See, China wants its fingers in different directions so that if one route gets cut off geopolitically, they have an, another alternative route to take. From Djibouti, right up the Red Sea, and, and by the way, Revelation 17 and 18, as it relates to Mystery Babylon and her destruction and the merchants and those who are on the sea are crying when they see her destruction and her burning. Um, this is a major, major seafaring thoroughfare. And I think that's very significant as it relates to Revelation 17 and 18 and Neom and Mecca, but we won't go there right now. The other alternative route is to the port of Elat. So when you get to the bottom of the V-shaped Sinai Peninsula, instead of going to the left or to the west up the Suez Canal through Egypt, you have an alternative to go up to the port of Elat, which is the southernmost port in Israel. From there, China wants to invest in a train 
Somebody today just told me this, this made the news again today. I had talked about it a while back, but it's in the news again today that China is interested in developing a high-speed rail in Israel from the port of Elat up to one of Israel's major ports on the Mediterranean, the port of Ashdod. So goods that will come via ship from China up to the port of Elat will be offloaded onto high-speed trains and then they will go through this short passage to the Mediterranean Sea to the port of Ashdod in Israel and be reloaded on tankers and moved off to Europe. But that's not all. There is also a plan where China will have significant benefit, but not only China, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which incidentally, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, here's the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain is right over here, that they will have a possible high-speed train, if you can believe, from Saudi Arabia, from this industrial port of Dammam, through the capital of Riyadh, all the way up. It won't actually go through Syria. It will go through Jordan and will come up right to the port of Haifa. Now, incidentally, that brings me to a very interesting situation. Israel and Haifa is part of the Belt and Road Initiative of China. They may not have called it that, but that's what's happened. China is one of the major investors in, in enhancing, increasing, and running the port of Haifa in northern Israel. I've been to that port. American ships and submarines have come into that port while we were there as a military base or, or a stopover for our military. And here, China is going to be running a large portion of the port of Haifa in Israel. This has caused major consternation between the United States and Israel because the United States obviously is concerned with security if we're using the port of Haifa, which is a strategic location in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Eastern Mediterranean, if the Chinese are running the port. Big problem. So Chinese investment, once again, is in Haifa. This has put Israel in the middle of a very, very difficult spot. On the one hand, you have the United States, great ally, best ally that Israel has ever had. And on the other side, China has been investing in light rail trains, in the port of Ashdod, in the port of Haifa now, in many respects. Israel was about to build the world's largest desalinization plant, taking ocean seawater and turning it into fresh water. They were about to embark and award a contract to build this huge desalinization plant just near Ashdod and Tel Aviv on their coast. And the contract was expected to be awarded to a company that's a Chinese company based in Hong Kong. At the last minute, the award was taken away from the Chinese Hong Kong based company and it will be built in Israel, not by a Chinese firm. And that is the doing of the United States trying to keep Israel from continuing to put investments in Chinese companies. Big problem. Now, let's move on quickly to the possible end time implications. Okay, this is, I know, what you're most interested in, and I am as well. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do. I want to draw your attention to verse 13. Now, stick with me for a moment where we're jumping in to this prophetic passage is in the context of the day of the Lord. This is the time that the end time framework of God's wrath, the time of God's wrath known as the day of the Lord. So I'm just jumping in right into Revelation, but I want you to understand the, the timing of, and the sequence of what we're talking about here. So the events that I'm going to be pointing out to you from Revelation okay, are in the context of, remember the final seven years we've talked about of human history? Okay? It's commonly known as the tribulation period. That's not really a good biblical term for it. More, more correctly, it's the 70th week of the book of Daniel. The 70th week of the book of Daniel. So or Daniel's 70th week. Final seven years of human history. Okay? We are on the precipice of entering into that final seven years of human history. The final seven years is not all God's wrath. God's wrath does not begin until sometime in the second half of that seven-year period. Okay, Now, when God's wrath is poured out, it is poured out by a series of trumpets. There are trumpets or angels that blow trumpets, and those trumpets 
are the wrath of God. Okay? So now when you come to Revelation chapter 9, verse 13, we're up to the sixth trumpet. Okay? So we're in the middle of God's wrath being poured out on the earth. By the way, if you're a true child of God and you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you will not be here for for what we're describing here and what we're going to be reading. You will have been raptured before God's wrath is poured out, not at the beginning of the seven years. We're exempted from the wrath of God, which again does not take place until sometime in the second half of that seven-year period. So Bible-believing Christians around the world will be raptured so that they will not endure the wrath of God. But for the unregenerate world, they will, and they're living on the earth, they will experience these epic events. So now we're up to the sixth angel, verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Euphrates. Where is the Euphrates River? Right here. The Euphrates River runs from the Persian Gulf all the way up through what is modern-day Iraq, all the way up into Turkey. That's the Euphrates River. So now let's go back to the text. Saying to the six angel which had the trumpets, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, specific time, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000,000. What is that number? 200 million. 200 million. And I heard the number of them, he says. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Now let's pause there for just a moment. So we're talking about, we're talking about the Euphrates River, Four angels were loosed that were in the Euphrates River and they're preparing essentially for an army with, of horsemen 200 million strong. 200 million strong. Now let's take a look. Here's the Euphrates River once again. Essentially the Euphrates River, if you, if you look at the geography, to the north you have the Caspian Sea, okay? To the south, you have the Persian Gulf. We know from text, and we're going to look at another one in just a moment, we know that this 200 million man army is coming from the east against Israel eventually. Geographically, if they're coming from the east and you're reined in, you're hemmed in here to the south with the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf, and to the north with the Caspian Sea, you have to come through Iran if you're coming from the east. And we know that there's going to be a massive encounter with these 200 million soldiers at the Euphrates River, thereabouts. So we know that this army, because, these, because of the geography, is going to need to come on foot. It's going to, on horses, it says. On foot, they're going to have to come through this area of the Euphrates River. Now, it says that they're on horse. That's a lot of horses. 200 million. However, if you read the text carefully, it says in verse 17, and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. What's the color of jacinth? Anybody know? It's like a gemstone. It's reddish orange reddish and brimstone it says the breastplates red and the brimstone is sulfur yellow i'm not going to be dogmatic about it i just tell you that the colors of china are red and yellow I'm not being dogmatic i'm just postulating the possibility of it i personally believe 
that, that the nations that are coming are, is not just China. I think it's a lot of the Islamic Central Asian Islamic Republics. Remember, 200 million. It cannot just be Iran itself. There aren't that many people that live in Iran, Iran total, not even close. I think the Central Asian Islamic Republics are going to be part of this, and potentially China as well, coming from this region over past the Euphrates River. Now let's turn over to another passage, to Revelation chapter 16. The context of this, you have the trumpet judgments. Remember we were talking, we were up to the sixth trumpet judgment, and we talked about the four angels at the Euphrates River. Okay, now we're at the vials. These are the bowls. These are the rapid fire. It's like a shallow bowl of judgment that is just poured out. Okay, and they come in rapid fire succession after the trumpets. So this is almost as if it is a continuation or a, a final cleanup, if you will, of what took place before the seventh trumpet, where you had the angels at the Euphrates River that we just talked about in Revelation 9. And now you have a continuation of that idea in Revelation chapter 16. And the sixth angel, verse 12, and the sixth angel poured out his vial or bowl upon the great river Euphrates. There it is again. And the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Okay, we just talked about the kings of the east, 200 million strong, that the way of the kings of the east and their armies might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Verse 16. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So where is Armageddon? Armageddon is in northern Israel just over the mountain from Haifa. Haifa is right along the sea. It's hemmed in by the Carmel mountain range, which is where Elijah clashed with the prophets of Baal. From Haifa, just over the mountain, is the massive valley of Armageddon. Is it possible that the things that we're seeing economically transpiring from China, from these initiatives, from their Belt and Road program, from the connectivity of the Central Asian nations that will also benefit from China's Belt and Road Initiative, that will bring them economically in connection with Israel in the last days. Is it possible that the things that we're seeing taking place economically with what is happening in the world, will that position Israel in such a place that it will be natural for these nations to want to invade her in the last days? All of this is a spiritual issue. In an ultimate sense, it's all spiritual. God is in control. He is orchestrating all of these events. He is using men and nations for his purposes to bring about his plan for humanity. But he uses these nations, and he has historically used them to bring judgment upon his people, to teach them, to, to, to help them understand that they are to look to him. They are to look to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. They are going to look upon him, the Bible says, they're going to look upon the one whom they have pierced and they're going to mourn. There's going to be a remnant in Israel in the last days. The nation is secular. The nation of Israel is looking for, to, to boost their economy. They're looking for these deals. They're looking to, to find friends in the Middle East. They're looking to uh, have China make investments. They want to keep America happy at the same time. It's a secular nation. But there will be a remnant of those who will stay focused and look towards the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns, and then they will recognize, they will recognize him as their Savior and Lord in the last days. Folks, we are living at such a momentous time. The more you understand about what's happening in the Middle East, it's like a chessboard and the pieces are moving, and they are moving so rapidly as what, in, in terms of what we're seeing today that we are on the precipice of entering the final days of human history. I can't tell you whether it's five years, 10 years, 25 years, I believe that we're getting very, very close. In the ultimate analysis, at the Battle of Armageddon, Jesus Christ will defeat the nations and take his rightful place as king of the earth.
Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-888. 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.